Greetings to all you happy warriors, and welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, remain, as always, dedicated to revealing how the world really works. Thanks for being part of the show, and thank you for all you do in promoting the show and getting the word around, and thank you also to all you happy warriors who placed early orders for our new book, the book that Susan Lappin and I have been working on for many years called The Holistic You, Integrating your family, your friendships, your finance, your faith, and your fitness. And um, that book, The Holistic You, is now shipping. Many of you have already received it. And uh, I thank you very much indeed. It had a very good, strong launch on account of what it was that you all did. So uh, very much appreciated. And uh, and onwards and upwards with that. If you haven't already taken a look at the book, shoot over either to our website or to Amazon's website or to Barnes & Noble's website or wherever you get your books and uh, go ahead and get your copy of The Holistic You. A, um, the, the topic today, uh, the, the, the topic or, or the, the title, same thing, is um, I must make money, but just don't know what to do. And this uh, was the result of uh, a chance encounter I had recently with a, uh, a fan of the show. And um, from our conversation, I realized that this was a topic that I did want talking about. But uh, in addition to that, I am recording this show uh, shortly before the uh, very serious and important day in the Jewish religious calendar, the Day of Atonement, which uh, we call in Hebrew Yom Kippur. And uh, what's interesting about that, of course, is that that word Kippur is the same word that is the derivation of the or the etymological root of the English word cover, like a cover-up. And uh, the idea is Day of Atonement. It's You can't make things go away, but you can cover them up, and you can function in that way uh, very reasonably, in the same way that if, uh, you know, if, if there happens to be um, a, a mess, perhaps a dog deposited some fecal matter on the floor, um, it's it's disturbing, and you want to get rid of it and get cl the place cleaned up as quickly as possible. But if you um, have no option, you you put a box over it or something, so it's it's out of sight and possibly the smell is somewhat confined. Um, covering something up is a, an entirely doable thing. Pretending that something never happened is just unrealistic. And a large part of a Day of Atonement is understanding how and training ourselves to be able to function, realizing our imperfections, filled with regrets for things that we have done in the past and, um, and fill us with a sense of, of self-dislike. Um, and it makes it very difficult to continue with life and continue uh, doing the things that, that you want to do. And so we have an annual program, lasts for 25 hours, and uh, it's a very focused program. That's why we don't eat. We don't not eat in order to torment ourselves or punish ourselves. We don't eat in order not to distract ourselves and to... Um, focus a little bit more during those hours on the spiritual than on the physical. And uh, it was exactly um, 53 years, 50 years ago, not 50, 50 years ago, that um, the Yom Kippur War launched in Israel. Uh, 
as you know, the Jewish calendar slides backwards and forwards by about a month with respect to the solar calendar. And so uh, this year, 2023, Yom Kippur falls on uh, September the 25th. But back in 1973, uh, Yom Kippur fell on October the 6th. And in Israel, on Yom Kippur, it's very quiet. A large part of the population is in synagogue for the whole day. And so, um, uh, for instance, it's, it's a day where many streets are closed. People walk down busy expressways just because there's no traffic. It's, a, it's an eerie day. It's the most extraordinary thing. Um, obviously, shops and offices and businesses are shut. Everything is shut. And you'd have thought that the beaches would be full, but they're not. And even though uh, a large part of Israel's population is not religious, it's not like in America. In America, not religious pretty much means hostile to faith and to tradition. Um, not religious in America largely tends towards the left. Uh, in Israel, that's not necessarily the case. And uh, even people who are not actively religious uh, nonetheless retain a fairly close uh, connection to the faith. And so the synagogues are packed. I mean, e almost everybody is in synagogue in Israel on Yom Kippur, which, as I say, will be February 25. What am I talking about? I'm sorry, will be uh, uh, September 25 this year. But in the year 1973, it was October the 6th. And it was at five minutes to two. Five minutes to 2 p.m., 2 o'clock in the afternoon, just before 2 o'clock, a high-ranking officer in the Egyptian Air Force by the name of Hosni Mubarak. Uh, as you well know, he became one of the longest-serving Egyptian presidents, serving, I think, from 1980 or 81 to, uh, to 2011. And he was upset then by, you may remember, the wonderful Arab Spring stimulated by uh, President Barack Obama. So at any rate, uh, Hosni Mubarak in his, in his jet shot up an Israeli communications base um, just over the Suez Canal. And he went back to his base, Hosni Mubarak, after the successful destruction of the Israeli communication base. And five minutes later, at 2 p.m., the Arab armies of Egypt and Syria launched their attack. Egypt crossing the Suez Canal and um, Syria uh, heading in from the northeast. And by the time the ceasefire had uh, been established, which was about October 23rd or 24th approximately, um, nearly 3,000 Israelis, Israeli soldiers, had been killed. Now, that may not sound like a lot to you, but let me put that into the context. That would be the same as if in America 300,000 soldiers were killed. Um, am I right? Yes. Um, th yeah, 300,000, that's right. Now, remember that the death on 9-11 were about 3,000. So a hundred times more than that. And it gives you an idea of what America would be like if 300,000 soldiers were lost in two weeks of fighting. Well, that's what Israel had happened um, in October 1973. Um the um, the hero of the 1967, the Six Day War, which was you know only six years earlier, in Israel was a one-eyed general called Moshe Dayan, um, a, a courageous guy, almost to the point of reckless, with some terrible flaws and weaknesses as well. And uh, he had lost an eye fighting in France during World War II for the British. And um, he was um, the, the visible um, 
icon of the Israeli Defense Forces in 1967, and he was very uh, he was turned into a national hero by the Six Day War. He made a number of terrible mistakes. One of them was handing over, although Israel had conquered all of Jerusalem, in this mistaken belief that if you act magnanimously towards uh, all your enemies, they will respond graciously and gratefully. And so he handed over the Temple Mount in Jerusalem to Arab control. And since then, that little piece of Jerusalem has served as a base for for insurrection and rioting and killing and stone throwing and all kinds of terrible things. But at any rate, uh, Ben Gurion, uh, excuse me, Moshe Dayan, uh, on the sixth of October was completely shocked and surprised. There was a massive intelligence failure, in spite of the fact that uh, Israel had some very highly placed spies in Egypt who had warned a day and a half earlier that war was imminent and it hadn't made the report hadn't made its way up the chain there were really really bad mistakes made and so when um, when the arab armies hundreds of thousands of soldiers began pouring over two borders giving israel a two front war um, everyone was shocked and Two days later, by which time Egypt had made dramatic progress into the Sinai territory, Sinai Desert, which had been owned by Israel since the Six Day War and served as a very valuable barrier or buffer because Israel's core military doctrine is for any fighting to be moved onto the enemy's territory as quickly as possible. And so um, uh, instead of having Egypt's armies mass in the Sinai Desert and crossing over and being in Tel Aviv within a few hours, uh, the Arab uh, Egypt armies had to be on the other side of the Suez Canal and the, uh, they never made it into the, um, the, the uh, civilian populated part of Israel. But they'd, within two days they'd made astonishing progress because Israel was caught napping, or to be more precise, was caught praying in synagogue. And so it took a long time to get people back to their bases and to mobilize. And even so, um, in spite of the fact that Syria and Egypt had been mobilizing for months uh, with huge numbers of men on both borders, Israel had just assumed that that was just another training. And... um, and they also made very terrifying progress in from Syria. Two days later, Dayan tried to call a press conference to declare the end of Israel and um, to uh, start international efforts to protect the civilian population because the both Arab armies had made absolutely clear that their goal was the annihilation not just the political conquering, but the annihilation of all Israelis, or as they colorfully put it, to throw all Israelis into the Mediterranean. And uh, uh, Golda Meir, uh, who was Prime Minister of Israel at the time, had to take action to prohibit Dayan from holding his press conference to declare the uh, end of Israel. I mean, that's literally what he wanted her to do. And uh, turns out he had, I mean, he had a whole breakdown. And, and for a number of years after the Yom Kippur War in 73, Dayan um, basically hid out from public. It, it was a disaster. He, uh, he was humiliated. He was, he was very much responsible for uh, much that happened, and, and it wasn't good. And so um, the other thing that's interesting is that while Israel was being defeated, and this is worth knowing, this is worth understanding in terms of geopolitics and uh, world drama, um, it's worth understanding. So let me just make this clear. While Israel looked as if it was going to be destroyed, and this is the first two and a half days, October 6th, October 7th, October 8th, and into the 9th, uh, it looked as if it was all over. The uh, Syrians were advancing from the north, the Egyptians from the south, and Egypt was going to be uh, brought to an end. 
And uh, as I say, even Moshe Dayan was convinced it was all over. There was no point in fighting. And during that time, um, the Soviet Union, the, the then Soviet Union, uh, ignored all attempts made by Henry Kissinger and President Richard Nixon to bring peace, to stop the fighting in the Middle East. Soviet Union had no interest. United Nations Secretary General Kurt Waldheim could barely be bothered to come to the phone. He was absolutely not interested. Essentially, uh, the UN and the Soviet Union were quite okay with the obliteration of Israel off the map. Then, after a few days, the tide began to turn, and uh, Israel began to get its military up and running and, uh, and going, and they began pushing back. And within quite a little time, Israel had crossed back over the Suez Canal, uh, had encircled and destroyed Egypt's third army, uh, and were on the road to Damascus. And now all of a sudden, the Soviet Union was uh, calling dramatic, we've got to have peace, there's got to be a ceasefire. The United Nations, everybody was into the ceasefire. So I have to tell you, this is something that um, Israelis in general and Jews pretty much remember very clearly, that in terms of the United Nations and the uh, Soviet Union and even, even Great Britain, by the way, uh, England had um, declared um, a uh, boycott on supplying spare parts to Israel during this period. Meanwhile, um, Henry Kissinger and, well, it was I shouldn't say Kissinger, it was really uh, Richard Nixon, um, uh, started sending huge military transports, taking equipment to replace what was being destroyed in Israel very, very rapidly. And uh, the, um, uh, the British, although Israel had purchased large numbers of British centurion tanks, um, the British refused to supply any uh, spare parts during this time. So again, there was something. The, the, the Israel has somewhat mixed feelings about Britain, um, as does South Africa, by the way, because of the treatment of Britain during the way Britain treated South Africa during the Boer War, as do parts of Ireland. You know, definitely mixed feelings. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I should tell you that the biggest tank battle in the history of the world since Germans and Russians fought at Kursk in World War II on Germany's Eastern Front, um, that was slightly bigger. But other than that, the biggest tank engagement, the biggest tank battle, uh, was fought in the Sinai, in the Western Sinai Desert near the Suez Canal from October 12th through the 14th in 1973. And um, there were a thousand tanks massed there fighting. And um, by the time that battle ended, um, Israel had destroyed 250 Egyptian tanks. And it, no, that was just actually in the first few hours, Israel had destroyed 250 Egyptian tanks. And, um, and then soon after that, they routed the Egyptian army and uh, headed over the Suez Canal. Um, they were in gunning distance of Cairo. And on the north front, they were on the road to Damascus when the Soviet Union said, uh, we're going to move troops to protect Damascus. See, they said to America, if you don't stop the Israelis advancing on Damascus, which is, is exactly what uh, the American government did, naturally. So um, that's what happens there. Um, the uh, American resupply process uh, was called Operation Nickel Gross. I have no idea why. But uh, six days after the war started, October 12th, Nixon, President Nixon began an emergency airlift and cargo planes took spare parts, tanks, bombs, helicopters, and they were flying backwards round the clock to Israel. They flew 566 flights of massive American Air Force um, cargo aircraft 
and uh, in in a matter of about a week or a week and a half, they delivered 22,000 tons of emergency military equipment during uh, the middle of October 1973. Um, so so that's, um, that's a little bit of that story. And uh, I tell it to you because, as I say, uh, this Yom Kippur, the 25th of September, is the 50th anniversary of the war that really changed things because there were six years of exhilaration in Israel after the Six-Day War. Um, you know, it, it totally and completely changed everything. I mean, people really believed that a miracle had taken place, as indeed I believe too. And uh, the, uh, the, the result was incredible, but it was six years. And then came the 73 war, and that was like a big dose of cold water right in the face of the Israelis uh, because they came very, very close to disaster. As I said, the dominant military personality, Moshe Dayan, General Dayan himself, thought that Israel had been defeated, that it was all over. And indeed, as I say, for two and a half days, it really, really looked that way. However, um, they rallied and began pushing back, and there were there were, you know, very, very, very painful sacrifices. As I said, there, there were a lot of casualties. and uh, But then eventually it did turn into a victory for Israel, although President Sadat of Egypt did regard it as sort of removing the stain of shame that had been hanging over Egypt since 1967. So Egypt kind of looked on it as a victory as well. Anyway, that is the story of uh, the Six-Day War 50 years ago. Um, talking of uh, 50 years, um, it's 54 years since the uh, United States of America landed a human being on the surface of the moon. That was in summer of 1969. And um, I just sometimes think to myself, what would we have said? Everybody is astounded, right? Going back to 1969, and uh, I was on a motorcycle trip through Africa. Uh, yes, young and stupid. And um, I was riding a motorcycle trip through Africa, and I watched the moon landing on an old black and white TV set that was wedged into the fork of a tree in a small African village, and it had wires running down to the battery of a car with a hood up, and the car was running to keep the battery charged so that villagers could gather around this little black and white TV set and uh, watch the landing of the moon. And I'm trying to think, <coughs> you know, back then, it all, it seemed this like amazing miracle. NASA, the American Space Agency, NASA had landed a man on the moon. What would we have said back then had somebody prophesied and told us that in 54 years' time, the same organization, NASA, that landed a man on the moon would be more preoccupied with the hoax of climate change than they would be with anything having to do with space? That's, that's really what NASA is involved in now. It's nonsense. And um, all they try to do is uh, each year secure their funding with Congress. It comes up every October. And before that, they always, every year, they always make some announcement about promising signs of life in outer space in order to make sure that uh, the government renews their funding for yet another year. There are a lot of organizations that should do the decent thing and uh, involve themselves in assisted suicide. They should get advice from the Canadians on how to do this. Um, so, uh, yeah, the Canadians are very big now on uh, encouraging the ill and the elderly to terminate their lives. Well, uh, NASA has pretty much fulfilled its purpose. It's not doing anything. It's just consuming money and providing sheltered employment for many, many people. It's not doing anything. Um, another organization that should do the decent thing and die is NATO. Again, you know, it's it's become sheltered employment for huge numbers of people doing absolutely nothing and uh, and having absolutely no purpose in the world. But there it is. 
Still, not the subject of today's uh, uh, show because the rest of the show is dedicated to the question that I raised just a little bit earlier, the beginning of the show, the title of the show, I Must Make Money But Just Don't Know What To Do. So what is the advice? Now, it so happens that as these things happen, the Ask the Rabbi, you know what Ask the Rabbi is, right? The Ask the Rabbi is a regular column. It's a, it's a, it's a page on our website at rabbidaniellappin.com. And um, it's also, by the way, uh, if I haven't already asked you, make sure you subscribe. We love it when people subscribe to the show. And so if you haven't done that, please do. And we also love it when you order thou, The Holistic You, uh, our new book as I mentioned a little bit earlier in the show. Okay, so uh, on the Ask the Rabbi page, we had a young woman writing and talking about how she traveled to France because she was accepted into an MBA program, a Master's of Business Administration. And uh, she discovered, what a lot of people discover, is that a university degree is not a license to print money. A university degree does not impose an inviolable obligation on anybody to give you a job. And she wrote, speaking about how um, with, with considerable challenge, she actually, she completed her master's of business administration. And meanwhile, she is having no luck at all in finding a job. And, uh, and Susan Lappin and I, uh, devoted the Ask the Rabbi this week to um, answering her question, giving her some thoughts of what she should do. Um, and so this is, in in general, this is addressed to um, anybody who's saying, I need to make money and uh, I don't know what to do. It's addressed primarily to people who have you know, may have got a university degree or, or, or maybe not, in which case they're probably better off, um, the, um, and who, who's trying to figure out where to start, and they can't decide what they should be, right? There are many people who stupidly took um, valuable years and valuable money getting degrees on uh, gender inequality in medieval French literature, or um, um, getting a degree in uh, in middle period Byzantine murals. I mean, this people did this. People wasted time and money getting degrees, and then they discover that there's not a lot of jobs available in those areas in which they got the degree. Fine. So what should somebody in that position do? And I, I did talk to somebody who spoke to me on this very thing, a young man who, um, who is trying to figure out what he should do. And so the advice I'm about to give is for them, but the general principles I think are useful to each and every one of you who is careful about your five Fs and your five Fs are your fitness, your family, your friendship, your faith, and your finances. And so um, I need to make money, but I just do not know what to do. Okay, let me tell you what to do. The answer is in four parts. Part one is find a job. Number two is excel at it. Number three is save money. Number four is work on your physical fitness. Right? There it is. All right. I know I'm not going to leave you with just that. I realize that uh, that is like me asking the winner of the 2012 London 100 meter Olympic sprint, Usain Bolt, how I can run faster. And he would answer and say, Lappin, it's very simple. Just move your legs quicker. Yeah, that doesn't really help me. And so uh, to just say, find a job, excel at it, save money, and work on your physical fitness, uh, I realize that doesn't do it. So let's try and um, be a little bit more helpful if we can. So um, first of all, okay, finding a job. Now, 
the, the key thing here is not to waste time and energy trying to decide what sort of job to look for because it doesn't matter. That is going to be one of the most useful things you're going to hear today. It does not matter as long as it makes money. Find a job that will pay you the most money. Now, ideally, it shouldn't be a short-term job, you know, like uh, um, helping to deal with a Christmas rush at a retailer or at a delivery company. Uh, ideally, it would be the job, a job at a company at which you can remain for a period of time, not decades, but a year or two or three, ideally. Uh, but you choose on the basis of where you can make the most. So fine, how do you do that? Well, um, you do not worry about trying to think of yourself as anything. You know, I, people think of themselves, well, I'm, I'm, I'm cut out of executive cloth. I should be an executive. I, I should be, a, it doesn't matter. Just put that out of your mind. Your job is to find a job. How do you do that? Well, uh, you tell people. Tell people about it. Now, if you are in a position where you can offer to work for free for a month, that is a very useful tool in your toolbox. It's a very useful weapon in your arsenal because it's an almost irresistible offer. But um, you've got to be careful. It's got to be somewhere that it makes sense. So tell people, in terms of um, what it is you're going to be doing, you really should think very seriously about starting off in sales. You've got to start off in sales. I'll tell you why. Most of the promotions in the Fortune 500, and this is a, I mean, this, this is a really important thing I'm telling you. Most of the promotions, people who end up in the upper levels of the companies started off in sales. Because in sales, you learn so much. You learn about people. You learn about finance. You learn about the products. You learn about the market. You learn about uh, negotiation. It's a fantastic training ground. And so uh, the, the reality is that if you are willing to start and make money in sales, you could have a job by next Wednesday. You really could. Not a, not a question. And what you do between now and next Wednesday is you go on to online and you buy a set of audio CDs of sales training programs by the late, great Zig Ziglar, Z-I-G-Z-I-G-L-A-R. Yes, he was a dear friend of mine. And um, Zig Ziglar was one of the greatest sales training people ever. And the great thing is now that um, you can buy on like on eBay, you can or other places online, you can buy his sets of sale training material on audio CDs uh, for very little. As a matter of fact, the Zig Ziglar company uh, actually, I think, is is selling some of the stuff some of Zig's great stuff right now. And so, you know, yeah, I know your, your current computer may not have a CD drive. It doesn't matter. It'll cost you, you know, $19 to buy a CD drive, plug it into the USB slot, and away you go. Um, at any rate, learn sales. This is worth more than an MBA, as the woman from France, in France, is discovering. So, um, uh, yes, you can literally walk into a job if you are willing to start off in sales. Great place to start. Uh, for interviewing, I've got to tell you two things. For interviewing, I want you to be very meticulous about researching. And there's no excuse today for not doing it. You don't have to spend three days in a public library. Uh, it's very easy to research. You really must know a lot about the company you are interviewing at, and ideally, you should know uh, something about the person who's interviewing you, but that's not always easy to do. But at least you should know the company well so you don't sound uninterested and indifferent. 
if you know about the company, you can sound passionate and interested and vital. Number two, I want you to always be aware how important it is to come across, not come across. Now, I don't want you to be inauthentic. I want you to be genuine, cheerful, and happy. Because I know that when I interview people, and it's the same for anybody else, life's too short to have people around you who drain your happiness, who drain your energy. So be energetic, be vital, be vivacious, be stimulating, but above all, be cheerful, happy, and optimistic, because that is one of the big overlooked secrets of job interview success. And so uh, tell friends and relatives that you're looking for work. You, you'd like to know about any jobs, any places. Um, get it out. Look, look around. But above all, talk to people because that is the surest way of getting an inside track. When somebody who already works for a company uh, goes to the recruiting director or goes to human resources or goes to the sales manager and says, you know, uh, I don't know if you're looking for anybody or not, but uh, I've got a friend, Tom, who is a terrific salesperson. I've got a friend, Jane, who uh, would be really, really good. Would you give him or her an interview? That is an inside track. And uh, energy and time will be far better invested in talking to everybody you know and everybody who you know knows and would be willing to tell you about so as that uh, you manage to make first-person connections rather than looking in ads, jobs wanted ads. Um, believe me, you will do better, much better, by connecting with people and uh, being enthusiastic and being happy and cheerful and uh, speaking about wanting a job. As I say, if you can bring yourself, and I know it's hard, not everyone can do this, but if you can bring yourself to start seeing yourself as a sales professional, and I see sales as a wonderful profession, um, it's a great, great, great place to begin a business career. Now, I should talk about one other aspect of this as well, and that is um, some of the people listening are saying to themselves, I'm not going to go look for a job. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm looking for a business opportunity. Look, um, in 99.9% .9 of the cases I encounter, that simply isn't true. Because if you were an entrepreneur, you'd already be doing it. It's as simple as that. Entrepreneurs do not spend three weeks looking for a job. Entrepreneurs do not spend three months looking for a job. Entrepreneurs do not spend nine months trying to decide what they want to do. They just go and do something. So let's accept that you're probably not an entrepreneur. Right? And, um, and that's fine. Because the avenue I'm suggesting, even if you suspect in the back of your mind that one day you'd like to be, this is still a good place to begin. And so uh, just um, go ahead and uh, find a job. Tell people and then perform well in the interview. And meanwhile, give yourself a fantastic business education by studying the uh, programs of Zig Ziglar, and he's wonderful to listen to. So uh, um, get the stuff, get the CDs, and just listen to him. And uh, you will discover that not only are you able to sell, and not only will you become very good at it, but you'll come to see that you actually enjoy it very much indeed. It's, uh, it's really, really important. And I, I speak as, as somebody who um, thought I was going to work as an electrical engineer, and I even did work as an electrical engineer uh, for a certain period of time for a big Dutch uh, electronics company. And I worked for a certain period of time until I discovered the selling side of the business. And I realized that... I'm a people person. And meanwhile, I was stuck in a lab with instruments and electronic components and blueprints on the wall. 
and uh, I was lucky if I if I saw another person other than on our weekly lab wide meetings. And then I discovered that the folks on the sales side, the people who were selling the equipment that I was designing, were making more money and having more fun and interacting with people. They were on the business side. And it didn't take me long to shift over there, I can tell you. So um, number one, find a job. Number two, excel at it. And it doesn't matter. Uh, it may be you're starting at the very bottom somewhere. Let me tell you the story. I, I taught this in a church in um, Huntsville, Alabama. I think it was Huntsville. I think so. Um, and uh, a uh, woman came up to me afterwards and said, um, she said, um, so she said, I have a job, but it's a go nowhere job. It's a dead end job. I'm a cashier in a grocery store. She says, and I make enough to support me and my kid, but uh, not very much. And I don't like, what do you mean I should do? I said, it's very simple. Excel. She said, I don't know what that means. I said, treat your custom, your employer's customers as if they're your customers and you are in business for yourself. You are a customer service specialist. And right now, you happen to have one client, right? The ABC grocery market. And they're asking you to ring up the purchases of everybody who comes to the line and wants to check out. But look at those people not as faceless entities who work, who, who are customers of your boss. Look at them as your customers. And I saw this beautiful smile of comprehension spread across her face. And she said, oh, I get it. And um, she, I said, what do you get? She said, well, I'm going to be polite to each one of them. I said, no, even more than that, smile at each one. And while you're ringing them up, talk to them. You know, get to know them. Well, a year, it was about 10 months later, I'm back at exactly the same church for a follow-up program on um, uh, increasing revenue, on helping people increase their income. It's what I do. And um, I had my daughter, one of my daughters was with me on this uh, trip. And I will readily admit that I cannot tell um, one dress from another for the most part. But this uh, daughter of mine, who was about 11 years old at the time, um, sort of pulled on my jacket. She said, Daddy, do you see that lady there? And she pointed at the woman who I'd last seen 10 months earlier, who was the cashier. And she said, Daddy, she's wearing a designer outfit. <laughs> well, um, I'll tell you that when I saw her 10 months ago, she was wearing, you know, what probably was a Kmart special. I mean, just a, a very unprepossessing outfit. But even I could see that this was a different story. And so I could hardly wait for her to come up to me, which happily she did even before I started the program. And um, uh, she wanted to give me a big hug. And I said, well, um, give my daughter the hug instead. Uh, we we try and avoid um, male female physical contact uh, of all kinds that uh, is not between family members. So no offense, but uh, but I'll accept the hug through my. So she gives my daughter a big hug, and then she uh, she says, uh, "My life has changed." I said, "Tell me about it." She says, "From the very day after you were here ten months ago, I started doing that." She said, "And I started noticing my lines were longer than everybody else. Not because I'm slower, but people started wanting to come to my checkout lane, and it didn't take long before my uh, my bosses noticed." She said, "And I was asked to um, to to give." training to some of the other new checkers who's starting to work for the company and they gave me a raise and paid me for that she says and then one day um in the line is a guy who um didn't have much in the way of purchases i think he had a cup of yogurt or something and he said to me may i ask what time you get off and she said why he said well i'd like to talk to you and i don't want to talk to you on your work time and um she said to me, she said, Rabbi, you know, I, he seemed a nice looking guy, but I'm not 
in the market right now for a relationship. I've got to focus on my job. I've got to focus on my kid, and I'm not looking for an involvement. So I said to him, uh, sir, uh, thanks for asking, but um, I'm really not interested. And so he laughed at me and he said, no, you misunderstand. I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not trying to pick you up. I am trying to offer you a job. She said, my ears perked up at that and I met him for coffee um, the next morning. And um, the uh, long and the short of it is that he hired me as the front person for his real estate company. He said, I've been watching how you interact with your customers. She said, uh, and he said to me, that's the kind of person I want representing the first contact with our company. Whether it's on the phone or walking through the door, I want you to be the first person that our customers meet. She said, um, I'm doing very, very well indeed. And she sort of gestured at her outfit and I smiled and I said, my daughter recognized your outfit, uh, outfit as a very fine piece of clothing. And so uh, that's what I mean by Excel. Deliver more than you are asked to do. Um, you know, uh, I don't know that this is true at the moment. I don't know. But when I visited Munich and I visited the um, uh, factory that manufactures very fine car uh, German cars, I discovered something fascinating. And that is that German workers showed up at their places on the car assembly line 10 minutes or 15 minutes before the shift began. And they used that time to familiarize themselves with what's going on, were there any aberrations on the machine to speak to the guy going off shift. They even did some lubrication and maintenance work on the machine. So is that at the moment that their shift officially began, they were up and ready to go. They didn't show up on time. They showed up early. And I thought to myself, that's why they have job security, because they deliver to their employer just a little bit extra. And the employer parlays that into fine cars sold at a top price. So, um, yeah, Excel, uh, whatever it is. Um, I spoke to somebody who is uh, in charge of executive transport for a multinational company. And uh, the reason I saw him is I was doing some consulting for a small department of that company. And the company arranged for me to be uh, transported um, between my hotel and the, the company several times. And on one of those occasions, the guy who was driving me um, didn't look like the regular driver. And I, I said, you know, tell me, tell me about you. What do you do? Anyway, it turned out that a couple of years earlier, he was an Uber driver. And um, he said, I just made a point of jumping out to help people with baggage. I, uh, I spoke to people if they wanted to be speak, spoken to. I kept quiet if they didn't. I asked them how they wanted the air conditioning. He said, uh, and I, I was cheerful always. And he said, somebody uh, in somebody, uh, one of my passengers on a ride offered me a job. And this was the job. <laughs> so all I can tell you is, no, step one, find a job. Step two, excel at the job. Um, three is quite simple. Spend less than you earn. All right. Uh, you must treat yourself as if you are a, an independent business. Don't think of yourself as an employee. Think of yourself as a business. And in a business, you have to keep financial records. So after you finish studying sales and selling by Zig Ziglar, uh, learn to keep financial records. Learn what financial books are. Learn what a balance sheet is. Learn what a statement is. Learn what a cash flow report is. And uh, start keeping very good financial records of your finances and make sure that you build up a savings account. Now, um, it's, uh, I, should, I should really tell you why you should do that, but um, it's going to be hard for you to believe how incredibly powerful the impact is of what I'm describing. Uh, the impact is incredible. It's actually indescribable, really, um, because even as a beginner, and this is your first job, 
You got your job like I told you. You're excelling at your job. And now don't spend everything you earn and don't go and buy a car with a car loan because now you have a job. You can qualify for credit cards and a loan. Don't do that. Start saving. And the spring this will put in your step is beyond your imagining. It goes so much beyond that. It goes so much further. There's so much that will springboard you to greater success once you have a few dollars in a savings account. It's all different. And so uh, I, these are very important steps. And the fourth and final step is during this whole process from right now, I'm assuming I'm talking to somebody who's looking to know what to do. Like I said, somebody who says, I need to make money, but I just do not know what to do. Okay. Um, start immediately on a fitness program. Start getting your body into tip-top shape. And whether you are a man or a woman, start on doing that. Start eating correctly. Start exercising correctly. Put yourself on a disciplined regimen. And if you do all these four things and do them well, you are are on a rocket ship to the stratosphere. You really are going to do very well. Forget the idea of making a lot of money tomorrow. Yes, I know that you know a friend who from nowhere started doing this or that. He started selling on Amazon or he started going into real estate because he had a friend who and he's making it. Just forget about that because those sort of opportunities almost never come to people who are doing nothing. They inevitably come to people who are already on a program. And so if that lies in your future, it'll come to you even if you are already three months into a job. And then you're in a great position. You can decide whether to leave your job and take it up or to say, no, thanks, I'm happy where I am. So there's no reason to wait until you think you know what you want to do. There's no reason to wait while you're looking for your great entrepreneurial opportunity to uh, make a fortune. It's all of these things, if they're going to happen, they can happen anytime. But they don't happen to people who are sitting around. So do not sit around. Get on with it right away. Get with the program. Find a job. Excel at it. Save. And get fit. Those are the four steps. And of course, as I said, each one breaks down uh, into the, the uh, smaller steps. What do you have to do tomorrow, nah, today, to start finding a job, right? Talk to people. Decide if, uh, if you can move into the sales arena, as I suggest. And I say if because some people are just so introverted that they are terrified at the thought of rejection, so then you don't do that. But whatever it is, you start talking to people, telling them you would like to uh, a position and speak about how your goal is to bring added value to your employer. You are really committed. Okay? And when you're interviewing, you don't ask about benefits. You don't ask how vacation policy. You're only interested in one thing, and that is how you can bring added value to your boss. That's what you're trying to do. And that's got to come across in your interview and it's got to come across as your entire lifestyle because that's what making money is about. The reason that making money is so dignified and noble and moral is because you are making life better for at least one other person. Now, if you're taking money instead of making money, that's different, of course. But when you're earning money, when you're making money, the only reason that another human being puts money into your hand and into your pocket and into your bank account is because you are doing something for them that is valued at more than the money they're paying you. So that's what you've got to be focused on. And tell that to your friends. And tell that to your interviewer. Tell that to anybody that that is who you are. You are a professional, devoted to the principle of adding value to your employer. That's what you are. And while these things won't initially come out of your mouth naturally, 
write them out, learn them by heart, so as that they do begin to flow from your mouth fluently. And these things make an impression. And that is what will move you onto the inside track. So find your job, excel at it. People will notice and puts you on the escalator. Save, right? Spend less than you earn and work on your physical fitness. And um, if you do all of those things, then you, within a relatively short period of time, within a year, and a year's going to go by quickly anyway, don't forget. The difference is whether in a year you're still where you are now or whether in a year you send me an email at my website and you say, thank you, Rabbi Daniel Lappin. You said something to me in the fall of 2023 and I heard it on the podcast and it changed my life. And that's exactly right. Follow it and it will change your life. Happy Warriors, that is as far as we're going to go today. So visit the website at rabbidaniellappin.com. If you haven't yet listened to the audio program on the book of Ruth, do yourself a favor. It's something I'm very, very proud of. I think it's a wonderful piece of work, and it is extremely helpful and extremely useful. So go ahead and get yourself at rabbidaniellappin.com. Um, you go to the online courses and you get yourself the book of Ruth. You will thank me for that as well. You really will, as, as many, many, many people have. And I do I sound boastful about that? Um, I'm proud of it. I am proud that I am serving other human beings. I am proud that I bring added value to each one of you happy warriors. And uh, if you enjoy the book of Ruth, then I will have brought added value to you. And I'm pretty sure that you will and that I will have done so. So um, please go ahead and uh, move forwards with your finances, your family, your faith, your friendships, and your fitness onwards and upwards with all of that until we are together again next week on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. God bless.